Okay, hello and welcome to day two and our fifth session of our second Amakitia Clarinet Extravaganza Weekend. And today's, or this afternoon's, topic is the balancing act of read adjustment. So in this session, we are going to discuss the mysteries of read adjustments with some of the top read specialists around the globe. So please make sure to write any questions you may have for our panelists in the chat during this session, and we will do our best to get them answered. So let's meet our panelists. So first, I'd like to introduce George Cooner, and he is specialized in custom and historical read making. He also teaches read adjustment to a range of players, from high school band players and read sections and wind bands to coaching professional clarinet players who want to refine their read making skills. Also, we have John Wiegand, who is professor of music at West Virginia University, where he teaches clarinet and conducts the WVU chamber winds. He's performed with the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra, the Cleveland Orchestra, and the North Carolina Symphony and regional orchestras, and has presented recitals and master classes at major universities and conservatories in the United States and Canada. Dr. Wiegand holds degrees in music from the Florida State University, Northwestern University, and Oberlin Conservatory, and his principal teachers include Robert Marcellus, Fred Ormond, Lauren McDonald, Lawrence McDonald, Keith Stein, and Kent Crive. And just um, I, as an aside, he was also my teacher at Florida State during my freshman year. I was very fortunate to get to study with him. And my dear friend Chuck West, Charles West, is professor of clarinet emeritus at Virginia Commonwealth University, where he taught for 30 years and developed numerous students now performing and teaching on three continents. He's performed and taught on five continents, is heard on many CD and LP recordings, is a Fulbright scholar and past president of the International Clarinet Association. His articles and lectures on read culture and making and adjusting have been published and presented worldwide. Thank you all for being here. Yes, thank you. This is going to be really exciting. So let's just break into this section session with talking about breaking in reads. So is there an optimal process for breaking in a read? And can you all describe your thoughts about that? Well, nobody's speaking, so I guess I'll speak. Um, I think everybody has their own little, little voodoo um, about it. And, and I, I try to break through, you know, there, there are things that you know and things that you believe, and they're not necessarily the same things. You know, but, but what we do know is that when you break a reed in too quickly, you tend to bend it inward toward the mouthpiece. In, in other words, the, 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 the reed will bridge up. If you've got a piece of glass like that, then the a reed will bridge up like that. And which in effect closes the tip opening. So you say, oh, my reed has gotten soft. In point of fact, the tinsel strength of the of the wood hasn't changed at all. It's just the tip opening has gotten smaller, and therefore it's like playing on a more close mouthpiece. You say, "Well, this is softer." So, it, so I think the one cardinal rule, and I'll let the other two gentlemen uh, either elaborate or, or argue with me here, but I think the one cardinal rule is just don't play it too much when it's a baby. So, you know, different people have different you know procedures. Um, my friend Steve Williamson in Chicago has a, has a very particular procedure where he takes very fine sandpaper and, and he just plays it a, a toot, you know, the first time and, and rubs it down and, and makes it very, very smooth. I think it's very, very important to, to make the thing very smooth and to seal it a, as much as you can. But uh, we, we have to understand that, that um, pushing it in when it's a baby like that is going to break those fibers down and make it, make it soft. I think I Chuck has, has nailed the point. And another thing is, if you if you play too much in, in the beginning, you get a kind of waterlogged read. Mm -hmm. And also the the material between the fibers, they will spread out. And, and well, we have to we have to think about the fact that this is a, a piece of wood and wood and water are not the ideal partners. Well, we need a little bit of moisture to make it to make it sound, to make it vibrate. But um, for example, I know some colleagues who really try to avoid making their reeds really wet and uh, wetting them a lot, but try to to keep that uh, that initial, well, um, 
springiness of, of a read. And I think the one thing that helps is have a procedure to do that and break in reads and take your time and don't play too much in, in the beginning. There is even a German word for uh, playing too much on a read in the beginning. It's called verblasen. That means just blow it away and it's it's going it's going to well work, uh, don't it, it is not going to work at all so this is one thing i would i would really um <clears throat> want to add that you ha that you have to take slow steps and increase when you especially when you play on on commercial reads i would really recommend uh taking your time and going little steps step by step i i agree completely let me add a couple of things I, I believe in soaking the reed in water, not in your mouth, because in your mouth, there are digestive juices. And so you're really beginning to break down the reed with that. So I use water only. I'll, um, I'll recommend putting it in the water, maybe 15 seconds or so, and then take a piece of glass. Let's see if we can see this or not. Yeah. And then while the reed is still wet, rub it down pretty vigorously. Then play it for no more than a minute, wipe it off and put it away. Do the same thing every day, doubling the playing time. One minute the first day, two minutes, four minutes, eight minutes, so forth. By the time you get to about the sixth day, you can play it for 20, 30 minutes, gently, of course. You can really never break it in too slowly. If you, if you skip a day in between, that's fine. Just take your time. You know, I think that that body make of, of um... John, John, those opening studies where where you got two lines where it's little Fs and, and you know those are great for breaking in reads because you don't go up higher and you, know, you don't go across a register break. You're just you're just not pushing real hard and you do maybe a line, two lines, put the read away, rub it like John says, and and put it away. I, I don't think I'm going to practice the solos from Till Eulenspiegel on a brand new read and kill it. Yeah, you guys have have talked about this a little bit. So, so you rec and I know some people say they don't want to articulate on a brand new read for a few days. Are you in agreement with that? No, I think you can do yeah. anything you want with that. I I would just stay away from the high notes. Okay. Bottom line. Bottom line is the is the read is going to go into the mouthpiece for for two reasons. One is because it's pushed too much, and two is because all wood warps toward water. That's, I mean, if you're an oboist, you, you don't soak the reed in your mouth because it comes wide open because because the wood is moving toward the water. So so you've got the wet inside of the mouthpiece and the dry outside of the mouth, particularly if you're like in Arizona or something, or if it's winter and it's, and it's dry and you got wet inside the mouthpiece and dry outside, it's going to warp inward, for, you know, well, I want to to add one one little thing. I've I've prepared some real uh, a read here that has a problem. It's warping. The tip is warping, and I'm I'm really prepared them to to be warped. So, and one thing to prevent that is trying to get the moisture out of it and um, getting the moisture away before you store them. And you should store them uh, on a flat surface and this helps a lot what i do to get the the moisture out of it i have an old sandstone and there i put it on and then the moisture most of it just goes out of it so um this really helps to to get rid of of moisture so this is kind of sandstone very very fine so you you can't take away something it's just getting away the the moisture and this helps with uh, mostly with commercial reads because I try to make a little bit thicker tips, but that's a personal thing. And if you break in reads, you should really, after playing it, you should try to, to get rid of the moisture or have a, a case which, which helps you to, to keep the correct humidity. This really helps to keep that stable. So because all these ups and downs in, in moisturing, the, the uh, make a, a huge difference for the for the stability of the reed and the and reeds tend to warp if the the humidity goes up and down a lot in my experience well so actually denise do you mind if we actually talk about reed storage since 
George sure. just kind of referred to yeah. that. So, so what are your recommendations? You know, we have a lot of things out there. I know a lot of people put them on glass and rubber bands without any of those humidity humida packs, those Boveda packs. Some people put them in cases with those Boveda packs. What do you all recommend how to store your reeds? In the winter or in a dry climate, I really like this Rico reed case with the little humidity packs. I use the 72%. In the summer or basically any time when I can wear shorts and it's more, uh, uh, more humid, then you can pretty much store them any, any place on a flat surface. It doesn't have to have the humidity pack. I just use these same things and throw the humidity packs out in the summer and put them back in again in the fall. Well, let, yeah. me jump, let me jump in here about the flat surface uh, for a minute, because right? you know a lot of people put their reeds flat down on glass, put a rubber band over it. And um, you know, I, I guess of the three of us, I, I'm, I'm the one that's been kind of the jack of all trades through my, I mean, uh, my, my doctoral qualifying recital was on oboe and uh, saxophone and clarinet. So I mean, I've, I've had an oboe read in my mouth a lot, understanding that wood warps toward water. So, so you've got a, a flat reed that's, you know, five thousandths of an inch at the tip, and it's probably, you know, a hundred thousandths of an inch up, up the incline a little bit. So it's going to dry first where it's thinnest, right? It's going to dry first where it's thinnest, which means that if you've trapped water between that piece of glass and that or that that reed and that non-porous surface, the water, is, the last place the water is going to go away is in the middle of the reed, which means the middle of the reed is going to warp toward the glass. OK, so I've done some experiments just turning it upside down and letting it, you know, if it's a Van Doren reed, it says Van Doren, you see the see Van Doren on it and let it dry uh, bottom side up and it tends to warp less than, than otherwise. I, I'd, I'd like to say something else too. Years ago in the old clarinet magazine, there was a, I remember the cover has Burnett Tuthill, Tuthill's picture on it. And the name of the, of the article is Some Climate Experiments where somebody took reeds and kept them at you know, 10%, 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever. And, and determined that well, seventy percent they would they would stay flat. Under seventy percent they would become convex, and over they would become con concave. For me, that was a that was a um, light bulb moment. Yeah, it's kind of a game changer. And for example, that the the recent when when I make reads, just a, a short thing on on that, I really try the after watering them one or two times, I really. Uh, put them this side, so upside down, uh, to let them dry, to to uh, to make them uh, get rid of the water. And well, I, I talked about that sanding stone. So before I put them, you see here, I get a, the the moisture out of it, so most of it. <clears throat> and when I store it, so basically most of the of the extra moisture is out of it, and. Um, we, we don't we should not forget that the the material is kind of expanding and it's get it gets a little bit spongy and bef when I have a new commercial read what I really love to do is beside getting the moisture out I kind of polish it so I don't take away s stuff I really polish it with a nail polishing file so this is a very old one and you don't take a thousands or a hundredth of a millimeter away. You just polish, you make it shine. And this, doing this three or four times in my breaking in process will make a, a really shiny surface and it is getting more and more water resistant. For example, when you put a little bit of water on this surface now, it does not get inside. I've tried that with a coloring, for example, and you can easily do that. So doing a uh, polishing and polishing of the sides, this may prevent uh, getting the too much water inside while playing. So this really helps and you don't take away anything. So, and even you do a little bit of banding if you like to, so the reed gets bad flat. If George, it is bent. George, do you use any, like uh, some people 
rub, you know, forehead grease, or some people use grapeseed oil. Do you use any any substance? On it? I I don't I don't do that. I tried it, but it doesn't. Well, I I don't like to. I I want to keep it um, mostly natural. So keeping it in into water, as as John said, is a great idea because uh, everything in your mouth is kind of uh, living, and so having a little bit water before is is a great idea because then less of of your uh of your spit gets into the reed so uh, one could do that and i love this polishing and if a reed is really working for me then i do also polish this side here but for me mostly this this part here is is interesting to to get polished and this is what i do before i put it into the case in the breaking in process. So it's not getting away stuff. I would use a kind of, of stone to, to, to get away material. So let's get away one hundredth of a millimeter. But this here is only polishing. And this is what I start kits on when I do read adjustments. But this also helps to, to make a shiny and water resistant surface on the bottom. Um, one thing about the polishing, and this is just my opinion only in my own experience and the places that I played, um, I'm in favor of the polishing, but I think you can over polish. If you polish too much, the reed tends to get bright for me anyway. What do you think, George? Is it possible to over polish? Well, I'm lazy, so this <laughs> wouldn't happen. Well, the, the problem is that if you if you if you have a, a grid around 800 or 1000 or something like that, you really you really take away too much. So what I have here is about a 10,000 polishing. So it's it's really a far away. It's even less than than a sheet of paper. And the problem is when you when you um, polish, um, some people do it like this. And then you you get away too much out of the corners so they get thin and then it may get shrill so i really prefer to uh, sand this way and not this way because you really get problems with the edges and this will lead to an effect you described yeah Somebody right. from uh, Facebook just said, um, this is Jerry Corton. He says, I used microcrystalline wax into my model reed on my reed duplicator. For kicks, I tried that reed after a few weeks, and to my surprise, it worked. Would anybody consider waxing a reed? I think, well, the, I yeah. think the reed needs to have some moisture in it in order to vibrate smoothly and effectively and have a nice sound, I would be afraid with the wax that although the reed might play, I wouldn't like the sound. Now, I've never tried it. That's just a gut reaction. But a reed needs some water in the fibers. Yeah. You really need a little bit of, of moisture to make it vibrate. There, there have been uh, scientists thinking about that and you really need it. What I did is I made a little bit of wax on this part here so that the capillar effect i don't know if my pronunciation is okay is less but for example if your if your low register is, is not really working you can spit on this part here and soak water inside that part but if your reed is balanced and working perfectly well you can put a little bit of bee wax here and this may help but i know people who do that i did that but i don't i don't really would say this is a game changer. Okay. Well, how about if you've, you've now you started breaking in your reeds, how do you tell when a piece of cane or reed is worth keeping and worth working on or not? And then how do you tell when it's not able to be saved? Good question. Good question. Well, okay. I'm most, I'm mostly a reed maker. Okay. I, 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 uh, I'll play a um, commercial bass clarinet reed because I'm lazy, <laughs> but but I make all my own reeds. And so when 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 let's let's say I cut, you know, I make blanks if I do, and then I come over here, and I don't know if you can see that, but that those are my blanks. That can you see that? Yeah, more so, reeds. <laughs> well, yeah, but no, we, that, those are boxes of morays down there. 
that's because I use a moray as a as a model sometimes. Yeah. But but I, I put a serial number on them. So you know, like this is read number four thousand, four thousand one, four thousand two. I have, I have twelve reads, and, and so I so I've written on them all with a ballpoint pen, and sometimes the pen digs into the wood and I'll put a question mark on it and it always becomes a bad read. <laughs> and, and I don't know why I waste time because I'm stupid, I guess, but I, if I waste time, on, I, I end up throwing it away. And then some, sometimes the pen stays right up and writes right on the surface and doesn't dig in at all. And I'll underline my serial number, say this is gonna be a good read and it always becomes a good read. So uh, I think just writing on the back of a, a read sometimes uh, on, the, on the flat part, you can tell if it's going to be, if it has the potential of, of being a good read or not, I think. George, what do you? Well, in, in former times, the people did a kind of hardness test using their fingernails and trying to get, uh, get to put it into the bag. Mm -hmm. And then they saw if it was, if it was a hard cane or a softer cane. And well, you have your, depending on the wall thickness and on the on the diameter of the reed you you may have different structure in at that crucial part where the tip is made of and when you when you prefer a little bit of a harder reed then you may be perfectly right so if you can't get into the cane so if it is a little bit stiffer and then it's going to be a good read. This is a, a perfect uh, thing to know if it is, if the cane is the right, has the right density for you. So if that works for you, it's a, it's a perfect workaround to, to see if it's good. So. George, kind of going off of that, we had a question from Jacob who said, um, going off the topic of the pin going into the wood, do you think it's a good idea to purchase um, a reed cane density tester? And if so, do you have a preferred reed heart density that you like? Wow. Well, I do have a reed density tester in my workshop and because I bought it together with other tools, but I don't use it because, uh, well, there are other, well, if you know your cane, you don't need it. And you can, you don't have to buy one. You, uh, you, there are so easy workarounds to, to have a density test. So I would not buy that thing for 700 euro. You can buy a lot of other things that are much more of a, of a, of a great help. Yeah, let's say it that way. Great. But if you have the money and if you like tools, go ahead. I was I was maybe secretly hoping that we could have a good disagreement about something. <laughs> Give it time, John. <laughs> yeah. I, that's right. I agree completely with what Chuck and George have said about the reed having potential being a harder cane. Now I've been making all all my own reads for 51 years, so I'm the same way. But I'm teaching a lot of students especially the younger students that do use commercial reeds. So how do we determine about a commercial reed? Um, reeds are, quote, bad, first of all, if they're not the right resistance, if they're too hard or too soft. You have to fix that first, either sand it or clip it, and we'll get into that. Once you have a reed that is the right resistance or close to the right resistance, a bad reed will be a reed that is very dull that doesn't have any resonance or doesn't have the good part of the brightness at the top of the sound. So if the reed is the right resistance and dull, it's gone. I, I think we, we could agree on that. I'm, I'm with you. If it doesn't have a ring, it's not worth playing on right. it. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, Katie Morrill had asked, because she, she missed the first part where, and I know, John, you had said that you don't like to put reed, soak reeds in the mouth. You like to just put them in water for just a couple minutes, right? Do, do any of you advocate, you know, any longer time period for reeds to be soaked? I know some people soak a reed and then dry it out um, and then soak it and dry it out before they start playing. Is there a difference between commercial reeds and handmade reeds in that process? When I, when I am making my homemade reeds, um, I will soak the, the blanks for 24 hours. Let them cure, uh, dry them off, set them upside down, like Chuck said, 
leave them about two days that way. Then I'll soak them for a minute or two dry, a minute or two dry, twice a day. Do that for maybe two to three weeks. Try and get as much of the, the uh, warping out as I can. And as Chuck said, put them upside down with the flat side up. As far as commercial reeds or homemade reeds once I'm playing them, I think it's 15 to 20 seconds in the water. Maybe 30 seconds if it's in the winter and they're really dry. Uh, now, with regard to, to warp, yeah, John, it's exactly right. Um, I, I, I like to, to show and tell this. This is this is a this is a tube of cane, of course, and somewhere in there, uh, you see. I don't know if you can see this, but I've cut through it with a jeweler saw, and then one of these things I've I've split. I can't remember where I split it, but but I I did that to to this piece. And you can see that big crack in there. So I, I cut through it with a jeweler saw uh, laterally like that. And then I split it longitudinally. And then I wet it and dried it once. And my point is that, that all of these tubes, all of this cane wants to, the epidermis wants to pull back and the inside of it wants to push out, which would translate in a flat reed that had never been cured as John says, in, into a reed that becomes convex on the bottom. Does that make sense? So, uh, yeah, I I personally do this. I don't I don't soak it for 24 hours. But it's kind of like Opperman's book on reed making. Yeah. You put it in your mouth and wet it and dry it and wet it and dry it. He'd wet it, sand it, dry it, wet it, sand it, dry it. I just wet, dry, wet, dry. And then I finally sand, sand the warpage off of it and then make the reed. And all that does really is it, it it's the word reed works like a hygrometer then it, it it adapts it to the humidity that is like here today but it but if you take it from here in washington dc where i am in the summer and go to flagstaff arizona in the summer where it's seven percent humidity no matter how stable they are down here in washington there it's going to go crazy and become very um, convex in flagstaff and vice versa and, have I confused everybody now? No, I'm so happy <laughs> that, that you came up with that 24 hour soaking because this is one point I would uh, really disagree with Kalman Opperman. And I've, I have one reason. It's not because of that uh, lying in that water, but if you have one, um, one piece of cane that has this, um, how do you call that in English, uh, mushrooms, not mushrooms. If you okay. you you um, sometimes you have these black um, mold. parts in a reed. Mold. Yeah, mold. Yeah. So if you have got one moldy um, uh, tube, you're gonna have a whole bunch of moldy tubes, at least a little bit. So I'm not a great fan of of soaking it too long in the beginning, and I really prefer to split and then work over several days and I do wetting and, and all that. And this is a huge difference between commercial and um, and handmade reeds. I only know one commercial reed maker who, who lets his reeds dry for two times. And for example, when you when you split that piece of cane and let it lie for two days and try to put the pieces together, you will see they won't fit because the cane has started to to come uh, used to its new, uh, yeah, that what Chuck, what Chuck did with that one piece. You can also do that with this, and you will see it won't fit together again. So, th so we have to 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 respect the, the nature of the material, and it wants to work, and it works together with the humidity around. So, yeah, but really, I I'm not in that twenty four hour thing, but well. If people have success with it, I'm I'm happy. But I I don't do it because of that mold thing. I think I, basically all you're all you're doing is wetting and drying it r releases whatever is holding it. I mean, it's when when the, when the tube is like this with with no splits in it. I mean, it's been it's been dried in the sun, and it has tensions in it. And wetting it and drying it lets it release its tensions and kind of. Kind of go to whatever level it wants to go to. I, yeah. I know I'm anthropomorphizing a little bit, but it wants to go to a certain place relative to the humidity that it's in right now. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Now, what about regarding, you know, working on reeds? Somebody asked, um, is it better to sand reeds while they're wet or when they're dry? Dry. And always sand with the grain, like George said. Well, I, I do sand dry, but before I make my final blanks, I do wet stone sanding. And this is from the old Bearman school. Well, this is a modern, modern diamond stone by DMT, but the stones Bearman used looked like this one here. It's from that area where the originally came from. And I do a, a water sanding with a little bit of water. And this provides me the most stable uh, surface on, on the reed. But, uh, well, some people have tried it. And it's, it's not about taking much stuff away. But it's, it's kind of, of sealing it and making a, a glass-like uh, surface. And some people tried it. I saw, I see Tom Powalski is is here. I put him on that and I think he, he likes it. And well, but you, you can easily do it other in other ways. And I really like that polishing thing with, with uh, commercial reads because it, it does something very similar. Well, for me, um, you know, when, I, when I'm cutting the reed to begin with, uh, you know, whether I wet it to begin with or not, I mean, you're going to get rid of that top surface. So basically, you're, you're uh, sanding dry cane. But then I, when I go back to adjust, I very often adjust with the sandpaper, it's going to be a little wet because I've been playing it. The other thing that I discover is I think, oh, yeah, I got this reed balanced here. Did I put it away? The next day I said, holy cow, how could I have put this thing away? It's so out of balance. So I end up, you know, it. I guess it wets, wet, dry. I mean, it, it stabilizes a little bit. And of course, we've shocked it by, by cutting off the vamp. By you know, by it, the cane is saying, "Holy cow, you did surgery on me!" I, mean, I got to recover. Yeah. Kind of thing. it's massive. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a massive piece of surgery that that you do. So you let it. I I, I never completely adjust a reed in a day. Yeah, no. So, so that that yeah go ahead about Jody. that that wet sanding um for example Gies van Leuven he's from the Netherlands he really he he does also the surface with the wet sanding very fine sanding and uh, also the WAMP and he has got great um success with it and well people some people like that I like I don't like that really really as uh, uh, shiny surface on the vamp itself only on this side of the reed but that's personal but you can do uh you can really work on the on the reed when it's when it's a little bit wet but you have to be careful okay so, so speaking of working on the reed can you all talk about the process of balancing the reed so how do you test it and where do you remove the cane and why chuck would you start with the with the with your explanation of the slight turn in um, of the mouthpiece, um, because I learned that from you. Well, <laughs> that's that's uh, nothing compared to all I've learned from you. I have to tell you, um, I just put the I just put put the reed you know square on the mouthpiece, and and and, um, and so and playing an open G, and and I think open G is important because. Number one, you're not hanging onto the, the horn very much. And number two, there's not too much tube to to make the sound stable. So in other words, open G is a more unstable note because it has less tube. So so I, I turn it a little to the left, I'm a little clockwise, a little counterclockwise, a little clockwise, a little counterclockwise. And there'll be one point, let's say, let's say when you lean on the right side of the reed, for example, the, the sound gets what we would say is better. It gets louder, it gets more colorful, and on the left side of the reed, it becomes less colorful. And so the side of the reed we're leaning on when it's the most colorful is, is gonna be the side that needs to be, it, it needs, it's the, it's the more resistant side. Does that make sense? If you're leaning on the right side, and the, because, because what's happening, I think, is in, instead of having the, the reed come up 
evenly to the mouthpiece. It coming, it comes up here and does its thing, but over over here, it's not completely, you know, completing its cycle of vibration. So so if if I push over here, then the lip pressure compensates for the resistance of the reed. So then I go back and my second test then let's and I and I said for example I'm pushing on the right side and it's better so I'm going to move the right side off the rail of the mouthpiece which is going to reduce the resistance on that side because it's got less rail to, to push on so I'm going to move it to the left if I think the right side is too hard I'm going to move it to the left and if it, and if it plays better then I've had two tests that have told me the same thing that the right side of that reed is too hard or is too resistant I I, I I don't want to use the word hard and resistant interchangeably. So it's, it's too resistant. So what I end up doing then is resistance does not come from the tip of the mouthpiece. By the time the, the, the cane is way out, I mean, tip of the reed, by the time the reed's gotten way out past the facing curve, it's just flopping around in the breeze. So I'm going back to where the, the uh, facing curve starts and behind that, I'm trying to make the, the cane stretch a little more and bend a little more on that right side. And so basically, I'm, I'm sanding or taking my reed knife or whatever I'm doing. I'm, I'm taking wood off at the facing curve and behind it. Of the mouth. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, when, when I start... Uh... When I start uh, teaching kids to to work on their reeds, I'll explain them that we have a a material that is made by nature, and when when we look at that snippet, I hope you you can you can see that you see there are a there are fibers, and this is quite nice. So the fibers go along, but on one side there are more fibers than on the on the other side and i want to have i want to have them feel with one finger how the reed feels and how it well where where it is easier and where it is uh, stronger well strange uh, words but they i want them to feel with one finger or with another finger but both sides so that they can adjust the tip. I know not, not everybody does that, but I really like to make people um, work on the tip and work with that, my preferred tool, my uh, this, uh, this polishing file with step two or one and balance the tip so that the tone production gets easier for them. Well, you, you, you need to have a read that works already, but that you can easily make this work. So because here starts a vibration, and if this is out of balance, then the whole read isn't working at all. So, but this is, this is a thing that really works good with kids, even with, with pros learning to, to uh, balance that. And I, I show them and I let them feel the the difference and this is where i start and the other modifications are things that i do later on so this is where i start and really recommend using one finger to test both sides not doing this this is a pure horror because you can't compare that so use one finger to check the tip you can use another finger from another hand but always check the whole tip this is where i start people working on on reads we had a That's question it. another question from jacob i just wanted to insert here he says how do you know where to to start while adjusting should you begin with adjustments toward um to the bark of the reed and gradually work closer to the tip or does the order of the adjustment not really matter i, I think basically you should start with the tip but doing the, the, so the sort of overall balancing that Chuck described, I will often start with that first and then go to the tip. So I will do the Chuck West balancing as he described it. Then I will do the balancing across the tip as George described it with, with my finger or some, some people like to do it 
using a using a fingernail, yeah. but uh, either one of those. Then uh, there's two other little tips here that I think people are going to find pretty easy and helpful. Um, I'm going to play a low C, then a, a G on top of the staff, and then using the G fingering, I'm going to play a high E and a high A. Uh, Okay, now I'm going to turn this this way in my mouth so I'm playing on the left side. And I'm just doing it with the voicing. Now on the right side, I can barely get the E and the A won't come out at all. That tells me that the right tip edge is too hard. So what we do about that is I put that, I think you can see, yeah, I put that on, on, a, on a small piece of glass and using a little piece of sandpaper, I'll sand out. I'm not sanding back and forth, I'm sanding out on that tip, just a little bit. It doesn't take much. Now it works really well on the right side as well. That read is going to be much more consistent and much more responsive. Um, I have a tip for the back of the read. This one was shown to me decades ago by Robert Marcellus. I'm going to play very, 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 very softly, double lip on a low G. And it doesn't really respond. <sighs> okay. That's even if the read is hard, it should still respond. So you can do that on either side. It responds a little better here but it really doesn't respond on either side. So I have this pre-marked. This is where I'm gonna be taking the wood off in the back part. Can you see that okay? Those of us, yes. can you see that? Yeah. I, I, everybody else can too then. Um, I like a reed knife, but a reed geek is good. Sandpaper is also good. I'm just going to take off. Can you go up a little bit? Like that? Thank you. Yes. Right. On both sides, using sandpaper, knife, or reed geek. Should have played it for you first, I guess. But now, there's a G in there anyway. Now I can feel the bottom of the reed vibrating. So there's a tip for the corner and a tip for the back. John, do you do you uh, measure the tips of your reeds? Just as a general reference point, about four thousandths of an inch. In in the center of the tip. Yeah. Do you look for a differential between the center and the corners? Just maybe a thousandth of an inch less, but not necessarily. I would rather go by the feel here mm -hmm. than a measurement. Um, if it if it does those two tests with the overblowing thing, then that's okay. the, you, you're right. saying you're saying less thickness in the corners than in the center of the tip. Maybe very slightly. Hmm. There, I I'm trying for the opposite. Okay. And and what I'm trying for is an absolutely flat tip when it comes off that reed wall, mm -hmm. and so then. 
so then as the as the reed clipper clips clips a little further up the incline on the sides than in the center mm -hmm. i get a little more thickness in the sides than in the center mm -hmm. i i try for about four thousandths in the center but if i can have five or six in the corners i uh, will i will do it by feel using this test yeah. rather than by the numbers yeah Interesting. No, I, I just i'd rather do it by how it plays than how it measures yeah, okay. Interesting. Well, this uh, having a little bit more in the in the middle is, is also part of, of the different schools. <clears throat> if you compare a a read from Wienie style with the German system and a Bohm system, you will see that the um the, from from the facing, the read has to adapt to the facing. Many, many players have want to have a little bit more in the middle than on the sides. And if you if you see the more open boom voicings, in my experience, um, there there isn't there isn't that that little uh, hill in in the middle. Wow, now that's that's fantastic. I have you, you saw on my desk a minute ago two boxes of Moray reeds. One of those boxes is way back from, from when I was with Marcellus. I mean, I, I, it's probably 40 years old, 30, 40 years old. And the other is a, a Viennese cut. Mm. And I, I notice those Viennese cuts are way different. Those Viennese cuts don't work for me at all on my mouthpiece, but I yeah. can make them work by changing the tip. A matter of fact, yeah. they, they're pretty good. They're pretty good if I change the tip and I stick them on the do all and and I just basically recut them like those yeah. French cut moray yeah. reeds from forty years ago. Yeah. That's, I, I'm, I'm. This has been an epiphany moment for me, George. Thanks. <laughs> oh. Well, right. let's talk. I mean, some of you all have talked a little bit about equipment, but let's maybe um, specifically talk about that. So, you know, I, I hear that some of you are working with your read do alls on commercial reads. Some of you use Read Geek tool, a regular read knife, sandpaper, dust rush. Let's talk about just read equipment tools and what you recommend for what and why. Well, let me start. The re John Wigand now owns the read do all company and he's straightened out a lot of the little foibles that were wrong with the Reed to all before and it's a fantastic machine. I, the one that you see over here over my shoulder is one that I bought from John and I got rid of the other two that I had. Hmm. Well I, I, I have a collection of different read making tools and the only tool I don't have here is a read jewel. But that's uh, that's a funny story because I have really loads of, of tools and but well we're talking about read adjustment and I think there are two two things I would really recommend everybody to have this is this two euro polishing file or something like this you can you can adjust the tip of the read you don't have to re use a read clip you can uh, polish the sides you can polish the bottom you can work on the on the on the tip of the reed with with thing like that and what i recommend is having a glass platter with um well i use adhesive tape and a little bit of uh, sanding paper two different grids one on this and one on this or a a diamond stone finest grid <clears throat> but to keep reeds flat well i always have to think uh, about my first teacher he, when when he adjusted my reeds when I was a kid, the first thing he always did was making it flat. That was his start. He didn't well. He he tried it and then he took it off and well yes, make it flat, and then we can start because if the if the if the bottom of the reed isn't flat, uh, all the other stuff well it's it's not of a great help. So you don't need a lot of tools, but you have to know how to to work with them. And I do re use a reed knife, but well, it's it's difficult to to learn how to to work with it. You need a little bit of practice. So this is my where I would start. Um, where I start is with a piece of glass. I have two twenty paper and six hundred paper that are glued onto the glass with spray adhesive. Yeah. I also put some little rubber feet on the bottom, so it doesn't slide around. 
Um, yeah. This is my this is my home glass. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> same, same here. I have a I have a piece about a third this size that I would take with me, and like like uh, put in my clarinet case. Um, I have always used a reed knife for almost all the adjustments because it's more versatile. I can do everything with that reed knife. Um, if I need to take a reed off overall because it's too hard, I would use sandpaper on a little piece of glass. This is three quarters of an inch wide and about four inches long. And if you can get three eighths inch thick, that's better. Um, so you could just sand like this. Um, I have found, I didn't know about this until recently, but I found a reed geek. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I have found a reed geek to be very helpful. I met the gentleman that makes them. This is really good for teaching students. This, the, the, the learning curve is a lot easier on these. And the other advantage that it has, when you're sitting on the stage, if the concert starts at eight o'clock, at five minutes to eight, you can take your reed geek and just do this on the bottom of it, on a, on a, on a corner of the reed geek. And man, it plays better. In the Baltimore Symphony, we had files that we would take out. At, at uh, five minutes to eight, we would pull out the file. But this read game really works better. So, yeah, there we go. <laughs> so I endorse a, a good quality read knife and a read geek and the, and the, and the piece of the glass. We just had another question come in. Can you compare the handmade cane with the reeds um, that we get out of our box? Hmm. Well, well, of course, it depends on where you get the cane. Mm -hmm. You can get bad cane. You can get good cane. I have had the best luck with good French cane and with cane from Argentina. And if you get a good shipment of that cane and it's a good year, then you're set for a long time. The best homemade reeds are better than commercial reeds. They play Absolutely. better. They last exponentially longer. Instead of yeah. two to three weeks, I have had reeds that I will play every day for five to six months mm -hmm. in concerts and everything. They last forever. Um, but you have to go on a search and find that good cane. What, what kind of cane uh, is out there you know, I'm, I know back in my day, you know, I, I had a whole thing of Donati cane that I bought when I was at Northwestern. So what do you guys recommend in terms of tube cane? Okay. Well, it, it depends on, on the style you're playing or on the, on the, on what you want to achieve. And well, I, I help people to, to get their, their read working, uh, into a good process. And uh, well, we we try Rigotti, Donati, Medea. From I re I personally love the reeds, uh, the the cane from Argentina. I have tried from Mexico, Turkey, from the uh, eastern parts of our planet. Well, you you have to know your cane and you have to to adjust it. And well, I think um, you you have to to be a little bit flexible and nearly every cane can be made into well every good cane that hasn't mold and all that and is straight can be made into a good read but the last five or ten percent are finding the right cane to your playing and well i i personally would 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 start with a rigotti or with a marker cane and then try others but more important than than the cane or Another important factor is that you really, really look for the diameter and the wall thickness. This makes a huge difference and it's sometimes even a, a larger difference than between the different growers. Well, this is very specific, but, but this, this may make a, a larger difference than the growers. Well, to, to answer you know, put my little bit of answer into that question. Yeah, I've got a drawer full of Donati over here. I've got box of Rigotti and and Pristini. I've got some Pristini cane. And uh, right right now, my best reads I'm making out of Argentonax cane. It's an Argentine cane. 
And I've got some Madeira cane that's working really well for me too. Yeah. Um, uh, the Pristi I've got Pristini cane that's been with me for years and it makes great kindling if you have a fireplace that, that, uh, <laughs> that burns wood and not gas. It makes good kindling and you can start a fire really well with that. But, but again, you know, um, I've gotten into good batches of one kind of cane and bad batches of another kind. George and I have talked about this also, but, but I, I discovered a long time ago that if, if I could make one good read out of a tube, I could make 12 good reads out of a tube or eight good reads out of a tube, whatever. Now, his, his point is well taken that it depends on where you take it from the tube, you get a little better or a little worse area. But in terms of the material itself, um, if I can make one good read out of a tube, I can make 12 good reads out of a tube, relatively speaking. If, I, if the first read out of the tube is, is a nasty read, I can't make a good read out of it, then, then that tube becomes kindling. I, I don't waste my time with the rest of the tube. I've got a whole lot of tubes back in the, in the closet there that are kindling. Does that make sense? Yep. Absolutely. So, and when you're when you're going into reed matting, well, today we we wanted to do, to talk more about adjusting. But when you go into reed making, you you really can choose and really go. Uh, you can really have a lot of parameters that you can work with, uh, from diameter to to tube uh, can, uh, to the wall thickness and all that, and you can choose what you want and you can have a. Uh, reads that are really specific to your needs and well if you buy reads you have to you have to work with what you what you get you you can't make them thinner well you can make them thinner but you can't change a, a lot of it and you can't get uh, rid of a french or file cut and all that and well there are advantages in the reed making process but you need a little bit of time and probably help to to get into it but adjusting reads is is also well Im important. Someone, another person asked a question. Miriam asked, "Do you use measuring devices to be sure where and how to do adjustments?" We talked about that a little bit. But. Uh, when? Well, I yeah. yeah. Go ahead. There are these these devices here to to measure cane, but. I think this is important in the production process, but it doesn't make sense if a read doesn't feel good or, or doesn't respond. Uh, I don't have to measure it. I feel it. I know where to to work on it. I can feel it with my fingers. I can I can taste it or all the senses that you that you have. You can use it. And I think the uh, doing measurements is keeping your your read making uh, straight. But uh, saying I need this measurement in this point is, is, is well, it's not necessary. And keep in mind, we're, we're working with a piece of wood and yeah. no two pieces of wood are the same. So not only are they hard or soft overall, but they're hard and soft in different places. So I'm going to say mostly no, as far as the read measuring devices. I have one also, and I could check on myself to be sure that the tips are the right thickness and so forth. But basically I'm just doing the, the adjustments that I showed you. I'm a little bit more numbers oriented, I think, than, than, uh, than either of you guys. Uh, I, I guess you guys are more sensitive individuals and I'm just a bean counter or something. <laughs> but we'll have to talk to our wives about that. And, but, but yeah, I, I, use, <clears throat> I use a veneer caliper all the time, because uh, one one of the things I learned as an oboist is is to try to make try to be consistent, you know. Yeah. So um, I I try I try for a read that's about one hundred and fifteen thousand or five hundred and fifteen thousandths across the tip, for example, and and I, I try for a blank that's about one hundred and twenty thousandths thick, and then I'm talking in thousands of an inch, and then and then I use this, which. Which isn't a read read thing at all. This this was I bought this from Sears Roebuck, and, and it's just a, a dial indicator. But uh, I that way I can tell if if I've got 
too much thickness in the tip, like if I've got more than five thousandths of an inch in the tip, and I can tell what the relationships are across the tip. I, I personally want the corners of the tip to be a little thicker. And and I think I learned that from Fred Ormond. Um, yeah, but but I think the the point is when you when you do reed making, you have to really go for specific uh, thicknesses, like my 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 the thickness of my um, uh, blanks is three twenty five or something like that. But when I adjust reads, then I'm away from that process. Right. So I I really I strictly divide into read making and read adjusting and and when when adjusting commercial reads I can't add thickness well not not really so I I have to work with what I've got in in front of me and then um, checking thicknesses isn't really the thing the way to go but in the read making process it's really important have knowing the width of the tip knowing the width of the bud. Uh, how long is my WAMP and all that. This is important, but n not really when I'm into uh, uh, getting into it and adjusting it, only when I want to alter my pros my process of read making. Then I, d and then I look for what, what have I done to that read or how have I changed it? How, how c did it come out? And, but in the, in the adjustment process, I, I don't do a lot of uh, measuring because I've done that in the read making process. Like I say, I think you guys are just more sensitive than me. <laughs> well, let's ask this question. Um, how far into the breaking in process do you start working on balancing the read? Almost immediately. Absolutely, just right away. If it's out of balance, fix the balance. Yeah, yeah. and remember what Chuck says, it's a, it's a longer process. It just isn't over one day. You balance a little bit the first day, a little bit the next day. Reads respond better to a more gentle approach rather than a shock balancing. Yeah, absolutely. Same thing's true of oboe reads. Same thing's true of double reads. So a little bit goes a long way, little bits at a time. I remember, I think it was Fred Orman told me, you can't put it back on once you take it off. So. <laughs> well, <Like> hair. <laughs> well, you know, you, maybe you can't put it, maybe you can put it back on. I mean, I'll screw up a read, and, and, but if, if I've still got, you know, 520 thousandths of an inch across the tip, I say, well, you know, I got, got plenty of thickness, I got plenty of width. I put it back on the do-all, I'll slide it up, I'll remake the tip, and I'll come up with a fine read. I have had really good clarinet reads that started life as really good alto sax reads. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's well, one of the advantages when you do your own blanks. So my blanks uh, are as long as they can be uh, from the, the table of the mouthpiece, and they are more straight. So I can 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 put it three times on a machine if I want to. And this is how the guys did that in the 19th century. They made long reads and then they worked on them. Well they messed it up and then they went to gone again because making that blank making it flat making it uh getting into that uh process of of preparing it that takes a lot of time so they they took it and made a new read out of it and so 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 do i and um, i think going little steps is is great but um you can also if you are into read making you can make a new read which is probably better than the one you had before. So uh, yeah, go for that. And for example, I think Tom Powalski, he, he takes his uh, Rico reads and put them on the regional and then tries to get new reads out of them. And well, that's that's fine. So um, if you cut uh, three millimeters you can, or two millimeters, you can have a new read with really good qualities. You will, people are impressed when they make a, re a new read out of an old read because this can be a really, really good read again. I agree. All right, so let's talk about students for just a moment. How can a student tell for themselves if a read is the correct resistance for them? Um, I have had a test that I've used for years and this is even more important now with COVID because I would routinely play every student's read in practically every lesson and you can't do that, at least now. Um, but I developed this to show the student on their own 
when you're in the practice room when I'm not around. All right. Um, my first test is I'll play an open G down to a low C stepwise really softly. And if the sound is clear, the read is not hard. Now we can think what that would be like if that read were hard. And of course I'm faking here, but it would be all fuzzy, right? So if it passes that test, G down to C, triple piano, it's not hard. I'll, I'll do this away from the microphone, but I'm gonna play a G on top of the staff up to high D really loud. And if the reed holds the sound, then it's not soft. Play it as loud as you can. Obviously, if the reed was soft, the sound would spread. So that's what I do. Any other advice, guys? Well, well, I always was with students. I, 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 I just, you know, when my students saw my hand going up toward their, <laughs> toward, toward the, the lower joint, they knew they, they, they know. Just play an play an open G. That's what he wants. Just play an open G, and, and I'll twist it one way and then the other, and. And I've, I've, I've done that with, with whole clarinet sections in, in a high school, go out and, and twist one this way, move your read to the left, move your read to the right, leave it, leave it there, and then listen to the whole section. And it's like the section just got a lot better because they put the read in the right part of the, the mouthpiece. Now, not everybody takes wood off. Steve Williamson and I were talking the other day, and the other day, a month ago, and, and he said, you know, if it works better on the left side of the mouthpiece, I just play it on the left side of the mouthpiece. So that's, that's his little, little thing. I, I, I'm sorry, Denise, I, I got way away from your question. You want to go back to your question? No, I, yeah, I, mean, I, but, think, no, I but, think, I think you guys are doing fine. Yeah, the, the, the problem is that, that very often kids don't put the the read on the on the right spot on the on the on the mouthpiece so this is the first point is it centered or is it on the right position and and can you can you put it up or down and often they are too wide uh, it's it's too uh, wide up and then you go a little bit down so you can you, you teach them how to how to put that in a position that it, it's going to work that they get the feeling and the next thing is that they put the the embouchure on the right place so that the the thing can 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 sound and there I put something on the on the mouthpiece on top so that they they know where the position is how deep they had to get it inside and it's a huge difference if you have a german or viennese style mouthpiece compared to a boom so there are four four five millimeters difference in that point where you you have to to have the the mouthpiece inside your mouth and well besides other effects there 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 is that point where that thing rings and starts to sound and uh, most often pupils don't don't get that point and then we can't talk about resistance because that thing doesn't sound at all so make it sound and then we're talking about resistance and then they will feel even better if if they if it is too hard or not. All right. Um, let's actually talk about synthetic reeds for a little bit. Um, I know uh, I recently started using Legere European Select, and I know Denise has been using those for quite a while. Is there any way to adjust synthetic reeds, includes including those by other brands? Yeah, I've I've made a, a nice uh, when 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 you when I saw that or when I heard that question, I I took something from my from my desk here, and I just want to show you one adjustment that a lot of saxophone players do to the uh, to the Hartman fiber reeds. Can you see that mm -hmm. that hole inside here? Yeah. So I made that just for. So this will will improve the low register massively on a saxophone read or on a bass clarinet read. So this is one of the really harsh things you can do to a read. Well, I just made this for for to show kids. And what 
you can do on on really hard reads or that that don't respond you you can do this on the bottom of the read just using a file a nail file but i wouldn't do that on a uh on a leger or stuff like that but this really works with the hardman reads if you play contra alto contra bass you may use this little trick here but don't drill through the read because then it's lost no there used to be a brand of read called sharpen that everyone had a hole yeah oscillator reads they're called oscillator or work hole oscillator But this this works really with the Hartman fiber reads, and I have worked on Leger reads, but not very successful. I, have I, I haven't been successful working on Leger reads either. I've, you know, and I've tried to I put them on the read to all, and it just shreds the stuff off. And I mean, it's <laughs> well, you can use a read geek and work on it, but well, I don't want to do. Well, you, you can do it, but you you lose a lot of money if you do it that way. So. Yeah. Yeah, so the only I've thing that I've heard is that if you boil water and if if you've got a hard synthetic reed, you dip it in there for literally like a second in boiling water and at least it makes it softer. I've read that several places, so I just didn't know if you guys had any knowledge of that or not. No knowledge. Sorry. Okay. I have I have tried synthetic reeds. And until I find one that I think I sound better on than a cane read, I don't have any interest. And I tell my students the same thing. Keep an open mind. Try everything. Yeah. But I'm not going to play a read because of convenience or you know, anything like that. I'm going to play what I think sounds best. And so yeah. far, I'm still on the cane read. Well, for, for me, what, when I'm playing an orchestra pit and I've got a bass clarinet and an alto sax and a tenor sax and an oboe and a flute in front of me, and, uh, you know, I'll play a cane reed on a clarinet, but on, on the alto sax, tenor sax, I mean, the, those instruments that you don't have to sound as good on, I guess. <laughs> uh, I, I don't, I, I, the, the Leger reed works great. Yeah, I mean, it works well enough. The, the nice thing is you, you pick the, the tenor up after it's been sitting there for an act and a half, and you pick it up and it plays just like it did before the show when you started it but yeah but, but that's a different kind of playing though you know totally different kind of playing i worry well, about the oboe reed drying up that's what i worry about is the oboe reed drying up there you're yeah i think when when you when it comes to saxophone and you you have really this this warped reeds mm, this should warp in a second well when when you do your own reads you you may you may work on them so that they don't warp so my for example my contra reads don't warp at all and uh, well i i make a little bit thicker uh, tips and and stuff and i i look for certain parameters concerning the 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 tubes but they they tend not to warp like this here you see it this is really horror and so i can understand when people use a leger because of that reason but if you are into read making you should be able to make a read that isn't warping that much and you should try to to get the habit away from the habit to make it too wet and well this this may help in the orchestra pit nobody said anything about uh, about uh soaking your reeds after you after you play them like for example i i play a i play a, a van doren bass clarinet reed and mm -hmm. when i finish it, it'll very often be a little convex on the bottom and well we know that more water will will make it concave but very often i'll throw it back in the water when i'm done with it until it becomes flat again and then i'll dry it and polish it and and put it away anybody else do that I will, I will always dip it in water for a couple of seconds just to get the digestive juices out. I think the reeds last longer. Hmm. Oh, that's a good idea. Especially if you're eating scrambled eggs while you're practicing, right? Or Oreo cookies, yeah. <laughs> or Oreos. <laughs> yeah. 
I think it's great that there's something for everybody out there and you find what works for you. There have been such amazing developments. I always think back to Cal Opperman, who literally wrote the book on remaking an adjustment you know, back in the day. And he was, when I was studying with him, he was still always open to trying any kind of material to create a read out of just to see what was there. So I think that's the biggest thing. Sometimes we have such prejudice as clarinet players that I must do this. And I think you must do this, what works for you, whatever that is. Find your sound and go with it, however you can create it. And but having this knowledge that you're sharing with us is really helping, will help people to be able to make the reads they choose to play with work better, right? I've made reads out of uh, other kinds of wood, li uh, literally pine, mahogany, whatever. To, to me, the worst problem with that is that the taste of some other woods is just awful. So yeah. I, I couldn't deal with them. But, and they didn't work well either, but just to experiment. One of our Facebook listeners just asked, can the panelists hear when someone is playing a synthetic reed instead of a cane reed? I would be suspicious maybe, but not for sure, no. Yeah, I get suspicious. But you know, Dave Schifrin came through here with, with this lovely, beautiful sound. Yeah, but he's David Schifrin. He yeah, can do anything. I, and and he, he's such a nice guy. And, and I, I got to tell you, he sounded so good. He said, yeah, I'm using the Leger read. Well, our, our, our two guests, the, you know, at uh, 10 o'clock this morning, Jose Frank Ballester and Karate G. Freddy. They're Leger players. Yeah. And my goodness, if I could sound like them. <laughs> If it works, use it, you know. It that, that's the thing. I think I think that's what we're all trying to say is that, you know, to each his own and you got to oh. find find your voice, find what makes you soar, you know, whether it's a clarinet or a reed or a ligature or whatever. And know that things keep evolving and changing, so stay open. You know, I would never have thought of playing a synthetic reed just a couple of years ago, but they've changed a great deal, right? No, and does anyone find that there are certain mouthpieces that work with with uh, synthetic reeds better than others? I, I, I can only speak that I know that um, Bakun specifically makes their vocalese mouthpieces supposedly to work well with them, but no, I don't know that for a fact. I've not compared well, it. I, I do a lot of mouthpiece work as well, and I don't think you that you can put mouthpiece is in a category this mouthpiece works for this read you really have to do it with each player in each setup and each read and so to really do it right i have to work with somebody here in this room and see what works for them and fit fit the mouthpiece to the reads and vice versa that makes sense john do you make a symmetrical facing yes I've tried the, the off-center, but the symmetrical works better. Well, kind of talking about reads there, can you guys talk about your recommendations for commercial read brands and uh, why, why you like them? What about them you like? Um, I have, my students have had the best luck with the Diodario Reserve Classic. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, they've also had luck with Bandron V12s, and sometimes I'll come in playing on the Brad Bain read, which I like too. And I'm going to say, sort of like I said before, try everything. Mm -hmm. um, starting about sophomore year, my serious players learn how to make their own reads. Um, our school has a read do all. And once they get going on that, I can't get them away from them. They're hooked. My experience too. I, I, I insisted that people learn to, all my students learn to make a read, even if they're not gonna be read makers forever. And right. uh, yeah, cause I figure if they can make a read, they can they can adjust the read. I remember taking uh, a read making class one summer with Frank Kowalski and it was fascinating. And it just, it's not that I kept on making my own reads but I learned so much about how to work with them and mm -hmm. you know, what was important about the reads. Mm -hmm. That's a, good for us to know. I think I would also say that um, like with my students, I encourage them all to, to learn on cane reads and to learn how to adjust them and work. Um, I don't ever 
have anybody say you have to play this read or something. I want them to find what works for them, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. But I ask before they go to a synthetic read that as a clarinet player, they learn how to break in and adjust and work with reads. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. I agree with John though about, you, you asked about brands and stuff, the the Diodarios and the Van Dorans. It, it, if it's good wood, if it's good wood, I can make it work. I mean, there, there are only two kinds of problems that you can have with a reed. One is organic and the other is mechanical. And it's kind of like cooking. You know, if, if I start with, with beef tenderloin USDA prime, then I've got a good chance of making a, a, a great filet mignon out of it. If I start with the chuck roast or round steak, the likelihood of my making a nice tender filet mignon out of that is rather small. Does that make sense? I mean, it, it, that's the organic problem or mechanical problem. And so if you've got a good piece of wood that's not working, then it's worth changing the architecture. Basically, you're changing the architecture of the, of the vamp to make it work on your mouthpiece. The other, the other point that hasn't been made is that, that the reed has to be a mirror image of the mouthpiece itself. So I can't, I can't on, on my mouthpiece, which is an asymmetrical facing slightly, I can't adjust a reed and then give it to John or give it to you and say, all right, this reed is balanced. Well, number, number one, in this day and age, germs cause disease and they didn't used to do that. But, but I can't say this is, all right, this is adjusted here. It's a, it's a great read, and John puts it on and says, eh, it's way out of balance, you know? Well, it's balanced for my mouthpiece, but not his. All right. Uh, somebody has a question. What is the philosophy on how long to play a particular read, and do you rotate every X amount of minutes to another? I would say if you're playing pretty much continuously, 30 to 40 minutes, uh, and I would only do that once a day. I would try to play every read every day. So, uh, you know, you can plan from that how many reads you need. Uh, six reads, eight reads, something like that. No, I agree. See, yeah, another question. Um, can you talk about the difference between a filed read or an unfiled read? What, are the, what, what do you mean by filed? And if you've used a file on it, I guess, to flatten the reed or to work oh, on it. Oh, wait a minute. You are, you, are you talking about reeds that are advertised, commercial reeds that are advertised as filed reeds? What, what, what is this person asking? Yes. Yes. Okay. In that case, I, I, I have to defer to George and John. I think we may have lost George. Um, I have used the file on a reed, especially to flatten the back of the reed. Like I said before, I found out about the, the reed geek, but I don't know anything about that filing a reed is particularly better or not as good than using a reed knife, for example. Yeah, they're saying reverse classic is a filed reed and the reserve evolution is an unfiled reed. Like that, that's what I thought we were talking about. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I think, and, uh, and you know, opinions are like everybody's got one. Um, but no matter how, I mean, you're either going to take the wood off or not, depending on how, and I don't think it really matters how it's taken off unless it creates heat or something like that. But I mean, you got to get the wood off of such and such a spot, whether you take it off filed or another way. I don't, I don't personally see a difference, but, uh, but I don't, I haven't made a study of these Diodario filed and non-filed. Well, I, I, this, this was one of the questions I, I really was deep into when I studied clarinet and I really tried to make reads sanding using a planner system and using a rotating um, thing. Oh, I, I don't know the English name now. So how they do it at a, at a factory, for example. And I personally um, came to the conclusion just for me that I, I prefer a little bit may uh, 
planned reads. So using a planner, but you can also make fantastic reads with a sanding machine. So it's it's not only the method, but one thing uh, is when you when you watch the the surface of a read under a special microscope, you see huge differences in the in the surface how how things look and well. So, but I personally really prefer a planner system due to different reasons. It has a little bit more springiness, so I, I can't describe it, but it's it's my personal thing, I think. Yeah, and just to clarify, I think I think what this person was saying is like the difference between a blue box, regular Van Dorn, where there's no mm. cut underneath the vamp, and then a V12 that is cut and then the bark is cut. Like when I used to use uh, White Master B flat reeds and cut the butt end off to make it into an E flat reed, I would cut under the vamp and cut some of that bark off so it would be more like a V12 reed. I think that's what that person was re okay. referring to. But, yeah. So when you Sorry. take when you take the bark off the shoulders, you're going to make the lower register respond better, as John pointed out about half an hour ago. Yeah. But there is an, another method you, you can have the same effect without, without doing that. Um, just may, may I demonstrate, for example, I really love to have not a 90 degree angle making the sides. And you can even make a stronger effect doing this here. So don't going down, but making kind of a of a rounding here so what take the do, bar George? taking the box off at the side and then you 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 get a more rounded thing and you will increase or better the the deep register too it it has a, a very similar effect than the so i use a hand planner to do that i overdo it a little bit just for demonstration you can also use sanding paper, but I, I prefer to do to do it this way. So if you have an unfiled read and you really want to improve the low register, you can do that uh, thing with the, the file cut or French cut, but you can also do this here, getting off the sides, but don't go down here really on the sides. And you see this here is, is really a, yeah, I, I did it. I, I, I overdid it a little bit just for for showing it you and in that, my experience, yeah you know, you suggested that to me uh, a few months ago and yeah. I, I haven't been too successful with, with that. yeah in my experience if you if you if you use a in boom clarinets don't should not make it too to uh to go that far because you don't use the the very thick blanks we use in with Viennese or German system reads, but a little bit may help. But it's just a, a thing you can do. For example, if your blanks are too wide at the butt, you can do this. You can do that too. But it it depends on the player on the style, and this is just one possibility to do it. Great. Well, everybody, this has been a fascinating discussion. Um, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. And I love hearing all the different ideas and the great um, community of knowledge here. So thank you very much for that. I feel inspired and I hope that people are watching do as well. Well, Denise um, and Diane, we, we all thank you for putting the, this together. You've done a wonderful thing here. Thank you. We love getting to talk with everybody, some of our favorite people. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks a lot for inviting me. And it was really a pleasure to talk to people from all over the world and really looking forward to. Well, and so that everybody knows these videos will be posted um, on our Amikitia Duo page and yeah. also on our YouTube page. So they'll stay up and you'll be able to go back and watch and learn from these gentlemen. Um, and, and don't hesitate to post any questions there. We'll send them on to them if we see them. So. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you guys so much. And I um, hope that people will stay around. We have our final session today at three o'clock central time um, talking about um, yeah things for young players. So for, I hope that teachers out there will join us and, and clarinetists as well um, to learn more from some great people. So as well, thank you guys very much. Thank you all so thank much. You.
stay safe. Stay and well. well, stay safe. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.